first person is Raghava. He's an amazing, a very accomplished artist today. People like Paul Simon have him in his collection. But I, when I met him 11 years ago, he was a young kid who already was a successful artist, but he was starting out at that time. And over the last 11 years, I have seen him reinvent himself every year to be the success that he is today. But to share with us his journey, Raghava. Hello, can you hear me? Hi everyone. Um, I'm an artist and an entrepreneur, and I want to share with you a bit about my journey. Um, can I have the clicker, please? Um, I thought I would sh first share with you a picture of my mother. I'm a big mother, mama's boy. And, um, and she's the one who taught me how to love. And most importantly, she's a big hippie. She hates me saying that. And it's not very different from the British, I guess, um, in being mama's boys. But ma the <laughs> I don't know if I was allowed to do that, David. Um, the rest of my family are boring academics, busy collecting Ivy League decals for our classic ambassador car. Um, but my father was a little different. He was a philosophical guy. So one day he was having his, um, his favorite whiskey. You know, he always thought that industrial revolution has hijacked our education system. I was in the eighth grade. I went up to him and I said, Pa, what is the meaning of education? What's, what does all this mean? He loves those kind of questions and started answering them by giving me a list. I quietly took notes, went back to him in my 10th grade and I said, Pa, I've decided I'm going to be, uh, you know, I'm going to learn really well. I'm going to be a good citizen. I'm going to work really hard. I'm going to be emotionally independent of you, financially independent of you. He was very excited. He was tearing up and coming to give me a hug. I said, wait, can I quit school then? And I quit school to become a cartoonist. I used his philosophy against him. Um, so I became a cartoonist and I started traveling doing thousands of caricatures. And the one thing that I learned from all my cartoonist gurus was that the best way to learn cartooning is to work with children. Children are the most creative creatures on earth. And um, so what I did was I started my own school at 18 to teach cartooning. But an 18 year old trying to teach, um, no one's gonna send their kids to me. So I thought I need to get some publicity and become famous. So what I did was um, I found out that the Prime Minister of India was landing uh, not too far from my hometown. So I thought maybe he's a good guy to help me out. And I went to where his helicopter was landing. I didn't realize the security. So <laughs> I, got, I caricatured my way through three layers of security by just impressing the guards. But then I got stuck. And uh, to my luck, a car pulls up. And a professor in whose house I'd done caricatures comes up and says, hey, Raghav, what the hell are you doing here? I said, I'm here to meet the prime minister. He said, oh, so am I. I hopped into his car and went right through security <laughs> and met the prime minister, caricatured him, and started my cartoon school. You know, it did really well. I was extremely successful as a cartoonist until 2001, September 11th, I made this cartoon. And this got me into a lot of trouble. What was a naive observation became a bit of a disaster. Uh, I was kicked out of the Cartoonist Association. I received hate mail. And um, my entire lifeline seemed to have been taken away from me. So what I did is I packed my bags and I disappeared into Europe, backpacking, hitchhiking, and, and just meeting people. Two amazing things happened. I met this beautiful girl and fell madly in love. And that's Netra. And the second thing is I started painting. But I never knew how to paint. Uh, I used to use uh, the best technology, the digital technology I knew, which is my digits. So I used to paint these large paintings with my hands and feet. And the idea was to dance while I painted, because I wanted my paintings to come to life. But unfortunately, the paintings never really danced. This is a, uh, I followed flamenco dancers. I followed um, uh, dancers all over Europe. But my paintings never danced. So I did um, something fun. I painted on the bodies of dancers had them disappear into a large painting and change the composition of that painting dynamically through dance. And that was great fun. It brought my work to life. I had a lot of success. Um, by the age of 23, I'd made my first million dollars. Uh, my wife was, my girlfriend then, was um, managing me, and that was wonderful. I felt I was on top of the world. And I thought the next best thing to do is to marry this girl before she runs away from me. So. <laughs> But notice one thing, after she became my manager, we were equal when we first met. Something happened, she was on top of me after 
<laughs> after she started managing me. Um, Nathan and I decided to get married, and we put together a humble list of 7,000 people we wanted at our wedding. We had this crazy art installation for a wedding, and um, everything was fantastic. I thought, life is, this is life. I had made it. Um, everything was fantastic until something really tragic happened. My mother felt very sick, and I almost lost her. And when this happened, my works turned really dark. Uh, I, couldn't, I was, couldn't paint with that enthusiasm and that excitement. It became more about, the thing, about abuse to the body, about how, how uh, I wanted people to feel it from their gut. And of course, the fun thing is all the Bollywood stars that collected my work, all the collectors, everyone disappeared, literally overnight. And that made me wonder uh, whether it's time to, be, to reinvent myself. Nathan and I had a baby, and we moved to America, and we started life again. Um, something crazy happened after I went to Brooklyn. I was a stay-at-home dad. I had a beautiful baby and a dog, and I thought I was special. Except you go to Park Slope, everyone's a stay-at-home dad with a beautiful baby and a dog. <laughs> I want to show you a children's book that I, I made right after moving to America. Uh, so what happened is, this is a children's book for the iPad, and it's a little naughty. It's what parents do with their children, except when you shake it, it starts off as a homosexual couple bringing up a child. You shake it, it becomes a lesbian couple bringing up a child. Shake it again, and it becomes a heterosexual couple. I wanted to sort of deconstruct the concept of the ideal family. And um, the next children's book I did was a book on India and Pakistan. Um, it's a very, very patriotic Indian book, except when you shake it, you get Pakistan's perspective on Indian independence. Shake it again, and you get the British perspective on Indian independence. Um, my work since then has become whimsical, but it includes biases from history, mythology, mimetics, and my own personal life. Um, I want to share with you my latest art project, and that's what I'm really excited about. I wanted to show you how my life and my art really informed one another. In fact, a lot of my work um, is about trying to bring my art to life. This is a project I did. Um, this is a project I did in a place called New View Studios with a with a hacker called Sean Stevens, and it's about bringing my paintings to life. When I was a kid, I hated this painting because I was told the Mona Lisa has the most beautiful smile in the world, except she was barely smiling, according to me. And so later, I learned when I grew up that if you look at her eyes. And, and look at her mouth only through your peripheral vision, she appears to be smiling. But if you look, dare look at her mouth directly, she is grinning. She's not smiling at all. I mean, she's, she's angry. She's stone as, uh, as cold as stone. So I came across this picture recently. It's a picture of an old woman. And she's a bit of a meme. She's been appropriated by, for several propaganda. So I thought, it's time for me to appropriate her. And I worked with Sean to try and bring her to life. I'm going to make a live, do a live demo here. I hope it works. Uh, this is an EEG device. And what it does is it measures about 13 frequencies from my, of my brain waves. And what it does it is, as you can see, it's sending alpha, beta, gamma, and theta waves to my computer. Can you move to my computer? And what I'm doing is I'm trying to see how I can change this Mona Lisa using my brain waves. So what's happening is she's responding to, to my brain waves. I'm going to try and um, get her really calm. I'm going to try and meditate so she can grin. Is it working? Come on. <laughs> there you go. Uh, so my, my dream is that art becomes completely participatory. I want everyone to sort of completely engage and participate in art. Because what happens is I, I believe the argument that creativity is the most important tool for empathy. Because only when you put yourself in the shoes of someone different from you can you really empathize with them. Can you actually imagine life different from yours? I feel artists are going to play an important role to work with technology to bring people 
to participate in their art and allow their biases, see? <laughs> allow their biases to, to show through. I, I have two children, and I think about what kind of biases I want to bring them up with. And the truth is, I'm an Indian, I'm bloody biased. And, you know, I can't promise my child a life without bias. But I promise to bias them with as many perspectives as possible, even if my children are my artwork. Thank you so much. So when I first met Ragwa, he was working with his digits, and now he's going digital. So quite a change. Woo! <laughs>